welcome to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Have you ever wondered how to stay sane in a world filled with narcissists and in an era filled with narcissism? An executive at the software firm Oracle once described his narcissistic CEO, Larry Ellison, as, the difference between God and Larry is that God doesn't believe that he's Larry. You may think that a narcissist is someone who spends their days on Instagram taking selfies and posting on social media, someone who's really self-absorbed, but the truth is, is that narcissism actually is a lot more nuanced than that and can be extremely dangerous to those in narcissistic relationships and undergoing narcissistic abuse. Tonight we've gathered a phenomenal panel of guests to talk about this subject, including one of the world's most foremost experts on narcissism, Dr. Romani Dervasula, who will be calling in later on in the show. But first I'd like to introduce you to Wendy Leesk. She's an author, life coach, and neurolinguistic programming practitioner and helps women heal from the wounds of abandonment. She also facilitates a weekly in-person women's support group, offering a safe space to explore relationships, heartbreak, and pain without judgment or shame. Welcome to the show, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, you've actually brought uh, something to give away to our viewers later on tonight. Tell us about that. Um, I brought my first book. I brought my book. Um, it's a story about life, love, and letting go. And um, I think it's uh, it, it comes with uh, some really helpful how-to steps and how to heal yourself forward. And something in this little box as well? Yes, and I've also included, uh, or added, I guess you can add it, um, offer it separately, but it is a connection ceremony or a ritualistic uh, ceremony of marrying yourself so you don't self-abandon, and it comes paired with a meditation. And I want to talk later on in the show about the significance of that ritual, but thank you so much for giving that away. So mm -hmm. if you want a chance at winning this, all you have to do is leave a comment on our Facebook page. We'll do a draw at the end of the week, and we'll be in touch if you are one of the lucky winners. Next, I'm delighted to introduce our next guest, Dr. Iris Jackson. She is a clinical psychologist who diagnoses and treats people with a wide range of mental health issues, including narcissism and other personality disorders. She is the founding psychologist of Gilmore Psychological Services. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jackson. Well, thank you for having me. As usual, our guests are excited to hear from you. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask on this topic, please leave your comments on our Facebook page, and we will do our best to get to them throughout the show. Now I wanted to start the show by asking you both what was the first time you remember ever encountering a narcissist and what drew you to explore work in this field? Maybe we'll start with you Wendy. So um, I think I'm not unlike a lot of people in that life experience leads us to a certain niche. Um, that's definitely me. My mess is my message to the world. Um, in the midst of my heartbreak I'd actually um, recognize that um, it was amplified by the isolation that I felt, self-imposed as it was, and I realized that I could not handle another woman experiencing that level of devastation. In hindsight, what I didn't real well, in the moment, what I didn't realize why it was so devastating was because I was in a narcissistic abusive relationship and um, I had to work my way through that healing. So um, I now offer a safe space, as you mentioned, the opening for other women. And what about yourself, Dr. Jackson? Well, as we were talking about earlier, I didn't know I had met narcissists until looking back, I think, well, maybe that was what was going on. Um, I think that a lot of uh, people have, um, I think all of us have certain narcissistic traits. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't look as gorgeous as you do well, in that you. lovely <laughs> outfit because we wouldn't care. Um, but uh, looking back, I think probably I met a couple in definitely met a couple of people who, when I was figure skating competitively way back when the earth was cooling off, and um, on reflection, it, it makes some sense that um, people who are in are performers uh, will often have those sorts of traits. It's when it becomes really destructive, when it gets extreme, um, but even so, it, it, uh, it can be extremely aggravating to deal with uh, or simply very damaging. So is narcissism on the same spectrum as having a high self-esteem? I think they're completely different. Mm -hmm. 
um, because I think Definitely. we can have um, a great deal of empathy and caring for other people and we can uh, have a humility about ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, we can uh, share the stage with other people um, and that so those are the opposite of what narcissists are and yet we still can have good sense of self-worth and self-esteem mm -hmm. because the shameful secret that narcissists are often hiding is that they actually have very low self-esteem is is that your experience Wendy yes it's a self-loathing it's it's not yeah it, people in their lives it's an opportunity for them to offload their shame onto you and um, at least that was personally my experience and um, yeah it's, it's it's the complete opposite of self-love it's self-loathing I would suggest that there's two ends to that continuum that there are people who have narcissism who have been badly damaged perhaps by narcissistic parents who are suffering low self-esteem and as Wendy said defending against that by being grandiose or feeling just denying what to put their feeling inside but on the other hand, there's a significant number of people with narcissism who had extremely doting parents. Interesting. And so you can come from a loving household and still end up being a narcissist. When it's excessive, when you're taught from a young age that you're special and the world revolves around you, um, and you're seeing some of this uh, in those societies where there was a limit on how many children people had the one child family and largely people were um, having boys deliberately mm. and uh, a goodly number of uh, those children were not raised to take turns to share to care about what other people feel because they were little mini gods so I think I think it can come from having um, uh, instilled grandiosity that you're taught uh, vers uh, versus trauma in your past that leads you to defend in a way that closes off and dismisses other people as unimportant. So qualities like vulnerability, compassion, empathy that are not traditionally valued in men and little boys growing up and maybe we're seeing less of the, those qualities being valued you know today in, in, in this era um, do you think that's why maybe we see narcissism as being more prevalent among men than women? Well, it is more prevalent among men than women, and it's possible, I think, that our society can instill that more in men. But it's not true that it's more prevalent in the millennials or the younger generation. Mm. The research that suggested that has not been replicated, and in fact, it's just pretty much, I mean, people have been saying for uh, eons that the younger generation is just too self-absorbed. Mm. Possibly it's just a stage of development. I mean, most people go through that in adolescence, you know, imagining a, an audience around themselves, but they outgrow it. And mm -hmm. The problem is that s some people don't outgrow it and they remain as self-absorbed as they were as early teens. But I'd say we're in a different society now where mm -hmm. the internet has changed everything. Um, yeah. The access and the level of entitlement to the parenting I think changes from um, generation to generation based on what we they got what you didn't get so it changes each each generation I think so I feel like you know the entitlement um, component is really big we're almost instilling it into our children where we're validating what they're doing as opposed to who they are so they're not getting the emotional validation in the same way that we do we glorify the activities their sports their you know we give them opportunities to to shine which is wonderful but they're not the emotional side is not being mm -hmm. fed mm -hmm. Wendy what was the aha moment for you when you realized that you were or had been in a relationship with a narcissist oh wow that was really hard to admit because at the end of the relationship um, you're in the midst of your own devastation of course and the rejection is hard enough but to admit that somebody had actually narcissistically abused you it then becomes a question of what does that mean about me mm -hmm. and having to face your own defective self if you can call that what part of me would attract this type of man or 
abuse into my life. So um, that came after it came after the fact, even though um, the vocabulary actually came from the narcissist himself. Um, he was accusing his ex, myself, other people of being narcissistic. So it was classic projection. projection. But um, you know, I just I, I did I didn't see it, and I guess I didn't want to see it right until after the fact when it's too late. Dr. Jackson, how do you diagnose a narcissist and would you tell them if they were uh, your patient? And if you did, how would they react? <laughs> That's an excellent <laughs> question. Um, first of all, uh, a diagnosis of anybody who comes to see me involves a lot of dialogue and questions and I give feedback and they explain their history and so on to me and what's distressing them. And, uh, and then I sometimes give some questionnaires that help clarify the diagnosis as well. But here's the thing, they don't go to treatment. That's right. Generally speaking, it's not until the, the person with narcissism uh, grows into the transitions of middle age and they bumped up against uh, reality and lost a lot of relationships and they're starting to realize that the world isn't just all about them and they become depressed. Mm -hmm. And it's the depression that might bring them in. The other thing that brings them in is um, the threat, you know, if they, um, of, of um, some consequence due to their actions, say at work where their boss has said enough of this, you know, and uh, get some help. Um, in, it used to be thought that they were, the people with narcissism were untreatable. That isn't true. It's not true. Um, there's a different, there's a continuum of, you know, as I say, people, all of us, normal people, um, and I'll vote for the two of you. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> normal is not just a setting on the washing machine. <laughs> Um, uh, right through to malignant narcissism and I quite I really think that you're talking when you talk about your life experience of having dealt I think you've been dealing with a uh, malignant narcissist we're just about to go to break but I definitely want to explore what a malignant narcissist is the different types of narcissists and tips on how to cope with them so when we come back after the break we'll be joined in studio by Dr. Romani Durvasula from California make sure you stick around for that see you right after the break Welcome back to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and on tonight's show, we'll be talking about narcissism with special guests Wendy Leesk, Dr. Iris Jackson, and Dr. Romani Dervasula, who will be joining us later on in the show. Now, we chatted a little bit before we went to break about how do you know whether someone is a narcissist. Uh, you talked a little bit, Dr. Jackson, about some of your experiences with narcissists in your clinical practice. What percentage of uh, your patients are narcissists, would you say? I'd say about 1%, about but 1%. far the most, uh, the most uh, people come with anxiety or depression. I do a lot of addictions work and I do couples counseling. Okay. And mm -hmm. uh, so in and amongst all of that, there's probably 1%. So for example, if I'm seeing 30 people, um, you know, maybe one or two of them would be, would have narcissism as an issue. Now, if you were to just walk into a room filled with people that you just pulled off the street, would it be also around 1% of them that would, might have narcissism? It depends on the community. Mm -hmm. um, so it varies from zero narcissists in the room to about six. And as you pointed out earlier, uh, if you break down that 6% of the general population, what you get is about almost 8% male and about 5% female in terms of being having narcissism as an issue. Now, if you walked into a room filled with uh, powerhouse lawyers or bankers or entertainment celebrity types, 
fancy academic types, you know, might that percentage go up a bit? Like, would you see this more in certain industries and in certain vocations? No, I do think so, yes, but I have to point out that there's also uh, another group of people who love attention and maybe take it to an extreme and are uh, very dramatic, and that's the people with histrionic personality disorder. So it's not clean cut, and it's it's um, all of this is on different types of continuum. Okay. We are now uh, joined on the phone by Dr. Romani Durasul. I just want to introduce her. Dr. Romani is on a mission to demystify and dismantle the toxic influence of narcissism on all of our lives. She is a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice in California and the author of two books, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist and the recently released Don't You Know Who I Am? How to Stay Sane mm. in an Era of Narcissism in Entitlement and incivility. Dr. Romani, thank you so much for calling in this evening. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to ask you, how does one become a narcissist? You've obviously seen many of them in your practice. What are some common traits and patterns that you've seen? You know, so when we think about how they become a narcissist, this is a long journey that starts in childhood. A person is not a sweetheart at 25 and becomes a narcissist at 26. A lot of this starts in childhood in the sense of how a child is raised. And more than anything, these kids, a, a child who might go on to become a narcissistic adult, can become, comes from a family where they're not adequately mirrored. So the, fam the parents is available some of the time, but not all of the time. The parent may use the child as an extension of themselves. So in other words, if the child is doing well, and making mom or dad look good, then the parent is all about them, or they really don't have any time for them. There are also kids who can be very over and underindulged, and by that I mean they may be very materially overindulged with time, with special experiences like going to amusement parks and all of that, fancy vacations, fancy schools, but their emotional world are completely underindulged. When that child has a feeling or is suffering, there's no one around to be found. So again, these are, these are early lives characterized by things being inconsistent, at times being invalidating, but also more than anything, that they're emotional, they're sort of emotionally hungry. That part of them is not given to them, and so they don't really learn to regulate emotion or value things like empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Jackson? Well, I agree with a lot of what she said, and um, I think it does go back to the, what I pointed out in terms of the two ends of the continuum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The indulged child, but as uh, sort of unemotionally indulged or not taught how to interact in the world in an appropriate way versus and then the traumatized child. Mm -hmm. um, now you mentioned that it sounded like Wendy was in a relationship with a malignant n narcissist and Dr. Romani I wanted to ask you to kind of walk us through the different types of narcissists. I know there's covert, there's mm -hmm. malignant, there's sort of mm -hmm. the wolf in sheep's clothing which absolutely fascinates mm -hmm. me. Uh, talk us through some of the types and some of the red flags we should be watching out for. Mm -hmm. So your classical narcissist is your grandiose narcissist. I mean, and this is sort of like the textbook narcissist. The arrogant, entitled, grandiose, admiration-seeking, look at me, aren't I wonderful? I drive a great car, I have a great house, I'm, the, I'm that person. That's what we always have traditionally thought of. But that's only a part of the story, and it's actually a pretty, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's classical. But there's a, the, the secret narcissist that we often don't see is the covert narcissist. And the covert narcissist and the grandiose narcissist are actually often considered to be two faces of the same coin. In fact, the conversation about covert narcissism has really only come up in about the last 25 years. Covert narcissists are also sometimes called vulnerable narcissists. And at first blush, they can actually sometimes appear kind of not as extroverted as those big, grandiose, entertaining narcissists. They can actually almost seem a little bit socially unskilled, a little bit anxious. They're often, they often seem very victimized, like mm -hmm. the world wasn't kind to them. And mm -hmm. they can often sell a rather sad story. I had such a rough start in life. Nobody ever caught me a break. I had to earn everything I made. Mm -hmm. And they carry their sob story 
as like a mantle, like look at me, look how much I've suffered. Mm -hmm. But their victimization is really one of their signature qualities. So they are also quite entitled, but their entitlement is like, why should I have to work like a regular person? Mm -hmm. I'm smarter than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to go clock in at a job. I shouldn't have to pay tuition at a school. I'm so much better than everyone else, which is again, the grandiosity. But instead of it being that big, shiny grandiosity, it's this very victimized, resentful, angry kind of um, angry. angry kind of grandiosity and so a lot of people who meet them often feel compelled to rescue them mm. they say I want to make it better for them I want to tell them they're great I want to be their cheerleader and in fact a lot of therapists get tricked by covert narcissists mm. interesting they meet them and think that they're depressed and they'll treat them for depression for many many months and make absolutely no progress because they see the sort of sad, anxious, victimized, isolated, resentful person, and they think it's all the negative thoughts of depression, and it's not. But when we push this out to what I consider the darkest form of narcissism, which is malignant narcissism, now we're getting into sort of the dangerous parts of narcissism. Now we're getting These into the restraining orders, right? Dangerous parts. Yeah, we're getting into people who are almost more like psychopathic. These are people who are very cold, callous, confident, calculating, charismatic, smart. Um, they will exploit other people. They will manipulate other people. They use other people as objects, but they can also be very, very socially skilled. And so these are people like you might see as like a very skillful CEO or something like that, who's really able to be a very successful corporate raider and do it in a rather cold blooded way. Malignant narcissists, again, can be quite dangerous because they are so willing to manipulate, coerce, and exploit other people. There are, it's also another fourth form of narcissism that I don't think gets enough attention, but I think it, it bears mention, which is what we call communal narcissism. This is, I think this is also sometimes been called like, called like a noble narcissist. Oh, the These knight in shining armor. Who you, yeah, they use their charitable deeds, like I've donated so much money, I coach the baseball team, I give back to my community, I'm a pillar of my community, and they really put this face forward of this person who is a saving the world, but they engage in that charitable giving, all of that world-saving behavior to gain validation and admiration. It's not out of empathy for the people they're trying to help, it's to get themselves validation and admiration. And people who are in close relationships with communal narcissists will say it's very confusing because the world thinks they're a hero, mm -hmm. but behind closed doors, they're actually rather monstrous. Wow, wow. Now, do these patterns resonate with what you've been through, Wendy, and also with the patterns you see in the women who attend your, your weekly groups? Absolutely. In fact, I see so much overlap between the different types of narcissism. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, there's definitely traits that I could pull from all of them that would have that apply and certainly in the women's abandonment support group they're all uh, a number of them come in suffering from narcissistic abuse and they they have the same stories what are some red flags we need to watch out for dr. Jackson I want to ask you that sometimes they're really obvious uh, I remember recalling uh, a gentleman I knew who uh, anytime he was it was like talking to some or listening to someone who was doing a monologue and uh, if I tried to chime in he actually would say um, okay and now back to me uh, so that's kind of a clear signal but I think the the other thing is that often we do get a sense as we relate to someone that they don't see us as a separate individual, that we're seen as either an extension of themselves or some type of object that can be uh, used to uh, do something for the person. And um, I think that we, it grows slowly sometimes, but we start to realize there's no empathy there, there's no real relationship, and really if if I stop doing whatever it is that he wants, then there'd be a lot of rage, narcissistic rage, um, or uh, abandonment. And uh, I think uh, 
we, we start to recognize because if we're empathetic people ourselves, we do realize that that emotional bridge isn't coming back to us. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about what narcissistic rage looks like. Dr. Romani, what does that look like? We're just mm -hmm. about to go to break, but maybe if you could just touch on it briefly. It comes in really fast, like you know, probably your Canadian weather does. It comes in really fast, like a storm, and it and it, it feels unpredictable. It's unexpected. It's disproportionate, and it's terrifying. Yes. For many people, they'll feel like I don't even know what set this off. And for people who grew up with families where rage was part of the picture, this often feels like a replay of what they may have encountered as kids. But like I said, it's swift. It's terrifying. It feels like you can't figure out the pattern. And it's usually in response to the narcissist's hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. For example, they perceive a threat or a criticism. Mm -hmm. A lot of our viewers have written in tonight wondering what are some tips for dealing with narcissistic abuse and some ways to manage relationships with um, our narcissistic abusers, especially if we can't sever the cord because they're family members. So when we come back after the break, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the subject, Dr. Romani. Please don't go away. We'll be right back. Good evening. Welcome back to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and we're talking about narcissism. Dr. Romani, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the warning signs we should look out for when we're first getting to know a person, for instance, that they might be a narcissist and that we should probably steer clear? I think you're going to, first of all, you're going to look at consistency, right? Is this a person who's sometimes on and sometimes not on? Like, you know, consistency, like if a person is up and down, and especially as that gets more and more inconsistent as time goes on, they may be able to bring an A game early in their relationship. In fact, that even has a name, it's called love bombing, mm -hmm. and it's a very classical part of the narcissistic relationship. In fact, a lot of people will say the courtship they had, or at least the first two months they had in a relationship with a narcissist, yes. felt like a fairy tale. They would go and go to amazing dinners, and it was also this very grandiose kind of an experience, but it felt like they were in a fairy tale. These are very Instagrammable relationships in the beginning. But then look for the little things. I always say to people, watch how they treat other people too. Are they dismissive of someone like a waiter or a bartender or another service employee? Watch how they drive their car. Narcissistic people are actually very careless drivers, often cutting people off or getting very rageful at other people for getting in their way. You also want to watch for other patterns, like, for example, are, are you seeing patterns of control? It's not unusual for narcissistic partners to be very controlling right from the jump. They want the good morning text and the good night text and how are you doing all day. And the problem is a lot of people confuse that with someone having intense interest in them. In fact, mm. they'll often contrast it to other dating relationships where the person would sometimes take a day or two to get back to them. And then in the early weeks they'll say, wow, this person's always in touch with me. How romantic. Mm -hmm. They always want to say good night and good morning. But then you'll notice that after a few weeks, the first time maybe you don't respond because of work, because you're driving, because you're busy, they may actually have a very angry reaction to that. You also want to watch how they listen to your aspirations and goals. Are they welcoming of them or are they almost indifferent to them? Do they, are they present when you're talking or are they only really engaged in the conversation when it's about them and sort of dismissive or disinterested when it's about you? Do they attempt to isolate you from things or people that matter to you? Many times people say, wow, I think he or she's so into me. They want me to be with them all the time. In fact, they almost seem jealous of my family, but they say it's only because I want you to myself all the time. Mm -hmm. And that, again, goes to that controlling dynamic. Things that are often romanticized early in the relationship, once you see them through a clearer lens of a narcissistic partner, you start seeing that they're actually relatively pathologic. Now, would they, need to, um, would they need to sort of have a certain percentage of all of the traits that you mentioned to be called a narcissist? Like, how do you know that someone's a narcissist versus, um, you know, low self-esteem or controlling or just a jerk? <laughs> so here's the thing. I'm gonna, here's where I'm going to put it to you. Does it really matter? I get that email a hundred times a week. I need to know if this person's a narcissist. I said, I just read your email and if all of this is true, they're treating you horribly. Why do you need the name? 
why would it make a difference at some level? Like, you know, because narcissistic personality disorder is actually a pretty low frequency diagnosis because usually people like that don't end up at therapist's office and they don't have the level of impairment we need for a psychiatric diagnosis because they're doing just fine. They're just taking advantage of everyone and having a rand all the time. But this idea that you want this label and that somehow it becomes more meaningful. Listen, if a person is not being empathic to you or being inconsistently empathic, if they're very entitled, if they're arrogant, if they're always seeking validation, if they're rageful, if they're pathologically jealous, if they're stalking and monitoring all your comings and goings, these are things that are not healthy for a relationship. Yeah. Will they add up to narcissism? Sure. I mean, it's a pattern. And, and remember, narcissism is not a diagnosis. It's, a, it's an adjective, it's a label, it's like calling someone stubborn or calling someone agreeable or calling someone, I don't know, feisty. Mm. It, it means something to somebody in the know, but I think people get so stuck in the label that they're like, well, he's not a narcissist, even though I feel like I'm being abused, so I guess I'll stick it out. I'm like, no, 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 unhealthy patterns are unhealthy patterns. Mm -hmm. And in general, sadly, they're not super amenable to change. So I always warn people, don't get so caught up in the label that you stick it out too long in an unhealthy relationship. Now for some women, uh, I don't know if it holds true for you, Wendy, knowing what it is, knowing that someone is a narcissist can help them process, can help them understand, it can, can be helpful. Like, was it helpful for you? Absolutely. Well, I've gone through two narcissistic experiences. The first one I was mm. not aware. The second one, uh, so I had to white knuckle my way through that that experience and heal myself the harder way. The, first, the second time having the name and the label exposed uh -huh. me to the communities and the support and so it gave me a different um, a lens to view my own healing. If this person is a narcissist, what is it about me, not necessarily that it makes me something specific, but it enabled me to dig deeper into my own wounds. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Romani, you, you talk about sort of the dark fairy tale of the empath and the mm -hmm. narcissist. I, I also mm. wanted to ask for your feedback, Dr. Jackson. Do you get a lot of narcissists sitting in your, uh, a lot of empaths sitting in your office saying, you know, I'm surrounded by narcissists, I'm being taken advantage of people with narcissistic traits? Uh, yes, actually, that's what you tend to see in your office as opposed to the narcissistic person coming in saying, I need help because my relationships are terrible. It, it, you know, it, it's true that people who are particularly sensitive and caring and um, have a high conscience and so, uh, you know, uh, they can definitely be much perhaps more easily exploited by a narcissist. So if you're asking yourself, could I be a narcissist? Is that the dead giveaway that just by asking that mm -hmm. question you can't be a narcissist? No, that's not true. There's actually mm -hmm. a research study that, uh, because they were trying to figure out whether uh, self-report uh, questionnaires were worth anything, and, and they found that the one question that actually worked really well to, to uh, identify narcissists was asking, are you a narcissist? And they would say yes. Wow. Yes. So there is that level of mm -hmm. self-awareness. Have you encountered that, Dr. Romani? I have. You know, in fact, one of my favorite stories is a client I worked with. First time he walked in my office before his butt even hit the chair. He's like, I'm a narcissist, fix wow. me. Which, of course, was very arrogant and silly yes. and, and grandiose, <laughs> but he was. He was absolutely right. And, you know, when we did the work. And so I think that I would say it's almost like a 70-30 split. And I would just say 70% of the narcissistic clients I work with were not aware they were. And as time went on and we built the rapport and we had the conversation, they became more and more aware that, yeah, this was their story, you know, that they are narcissistic people. But instead of, you know, slamming them over the head with it because they would have probably walked out of my office, mm -hmm. I would point the patterns out and say, could you understand that what you did was so dismissive that it could have hurt that other person? Now, two days later, they'd see it in my office, but in real time, they weren't acting on it. And I gotta tell you, the amount of progress I've made with these clients is pretty minimal. I mean, mm -hmm. we've gotten better. They say thank you a little bit more. They show up on time, but they're not very nice to me. They're not very nice to other people. They're very dismissive. So maybe like if, if they come into me at zero and 10 is healthy, if I'm lucky, I get them to three or four. Wow. But I really think you need 10 to be in a relationship with them. And so I think you can do some work and you might be able to get them to maybe be slightly better coworkers or maybe a little bit more self-aware, but more often than not, they don't get it right because of how deep the core of this disorder is. And so, yeah, no, I mean, they, many of them are self-aware, but not, not a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Not so, a lot. I think we have to do some work to get them there. Dr. Jackson. Um, I was just going to say that there's, in fact, neurological uh, studies, uh, functional MRIs, that uh, illustrate that there is uh, there are areas of the brain that are related to empathy and related to perceptiveness of other people um, that don't light up. They, they, there's actual deficits there. And I think that that, uh, for, for people with th those sorts of uh, brain problems, uh, it's much harder to get any movement. But I have to say that narcissism does have social causes as well. And I think in those cases, you may not get someone to be uh, a, a total empath, but uh, there's, there's also perceptiveness. People can become more perceptive about their impact on other people. And even if it's for um, reasons that are instrumental to them, they can become uh, better people mm -hmm. in relationships. I don't think you necessarily want to marry them, but they yeah. certainly can become better co-workers. Dr. Almani, what are some tips for <clears throat> managing a relationship with a narcissist, especially mm -hmm. if you can't cut the core, like if they're a family member yeah. or a boss you can't get away from, or, or maybe someone that you're in a relationship with and you're just not ready to leave? What are some coping mm -hmm. mechanisms? What are some tips? And just to, just so your audience hears this, because many of people who are listening are like, I don't know if I'm going to say this or not. Half of people say. 50% of people stay in these relationships. So if you say it's not like you, you're weak or you're silly or you're dumb, you're normal. Okay, half stay, half go. So what are some things you can do? Number one, and above all else, have realistic expectations. Once you understand, and that Wendy made that point, once she understood what this pattern was, she had a handle on it, you almost know the landscape. It's like someone giving you a map. You're like, oh, there's a river, better turn around. You know, it's, it's similar with narcissism. Your expectations become realistic. They're not gonna be the person who congratulates me for a promotion. Mm -hmm. They are not gonna be empathic for me when I'm crying because I'm worried about my mom's illness. They're not gonna care when I need a day off because my kid is sick from the job. They're not going to come up with that typical empathy. You're gonna have to figure out the workaround. But where you get hurt is if you keep going back into that relationship, expecting them to have healthy, validating, compassionate reactions, and they never do. So it really helps you kind of get ahead of that and feel like you actually have a little bit more power and you know, self, being more self-possessed in that relationship. And the other turn is, is the related riff is radical acceptance. Like, this is it. This is what this relationship looks like, and you ain't going to get much better than this. Mm -hmm. And under those conditions, people then learn to do things. Like they may say, you know what? I may end up having to take my vacations with my friend instead of my partner. It may very well be I'm going to log in another two years on this job to be able to get whatever benefit I need, but then it may be time to go. Like it's really the sense of I need to build up other kinds of close relationships that are healthy. I need to engage in rituals to take, take care of myself. One thing that a lot of people where the great loss of innocence happens in narcissistic relationships is a person gets sick and they're like, this is it. Now my narcissist is going to come to my hospital bed and they're finally going to get it. And you know what? The narcissist gets angry because they feel inconvenienced. Are you kidding me? I've got to go to the hospital. I got to wake up early in the morning. And that is an utter devastation. You can set your watch by the fact that this person isn't going to show up to your hospital bed. So that's the radical acceptance. And if you can really hold on to that, then I think that you can endure it, not get as hurt, and not be as scrambled. But then some of the other strategies I suggest to people in the day-to-day -day are things like just, don't engage with them. We're just engage about to go to... Them we're rarely just, goes well. You've we're just about to go to break. level of engagement. You also, and keep it yeah. slim and trim. Sorry, Dr. Romani, we're just about to go to, to break, them. so Definitely. I want to be able to continue the conversation after we come back. Yeah. Definitely want to hear more of what you have to yeah, say. Sure, Don't go away. We'll be right yeah. back. Welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and we're talking about narcissism. Dr. Romani, I'm sorry I had to cut you off there just before we went uh, to break, but I would like to reignite the conversation where we talked about strategies for how people can deal mm -hmm. with the narcissists in their lives, especially the ones that they can't get away from. 
so one of the things I, I, I again, sorry for yammering on, I kind of oh. get a little impassioned about it. No worries, it's wonderful to see. Um, but the, the thing I tell people is really be careful how much you engage. I always say that like these are, you really can only engage a little bit and keep it tight, like focus on the problem at hand. A lot of times the more you talk to someone, the more you make yourself vulnerable, the more likely you're gonna find yourself in hot, yourself in hot water. So I tell people, keep your engagement kind of tight and minimal and stick to topics where you aren't gonna get into trouble. Things like the weather or I don't know, some sort of passing thing that happened that day that again, that doesn't make you vulnerable. I also tell people because narcissists are so vulnerable to patterns like gaslighting, projection, Let's denial, talk about that. Like that what, what, what is gaslighting? Mm -hmm. What is gaslighting? Gaslighting is the the gaslighting is the deliberate uh, the deliberate doubting of the reality of someone's experience. So it would be like me saying things like you're being too sensitive or that never happened or you're making too much of a big deal about this or maybe you're the narcissist. It's like they completely twist your reality to a way that you actually start feeling confused. You start losing grip of your own reality and it's actually considered to be a form of emotional abuse. It's a pretty classical dynamic in a narcissistic relationship and it's how narcissistic abuse is able to really harm someone because by the end of the relationship, and I'm sure Wendy will resonate with this, you're left as a shell of yourself and you no longer even know what your own truth is. You're not even sure like, you know, is the sky purple? Like, am I hungry? You don't, you start doubting everything. Mm -hmm. And under those circumstances, when somebody's engaging in denial or gaslighting or projecting their feelings onto you, and you're confused, your, your, your temptation is to explain to them, no, 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 let me explain. Don't explain. They're not listening. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is just giving them more ammunition to just keep spinning you around and around and around. Mm -hmm. But always say, Keep your conversations tight and trim, and if it's a workplace, make sure you document everything. Do not ever assume a casual conversation happened. Put it all in writing. If you happen to be going through divorce or other form of litigation with a, a narcissist, same thing. Everything in writing and save everything. Save every text, save every email, save every voicemail. You're going to need it because it can really get quite monstrous if you're in, again, a legal setting or a workplace kind of a setting. Obviously, this is more complicated in families, but the same thing. I tell people, when you go for Thanksgiving dinner or holiday dinner or Sunday dinner, have a list of topics on a little piece of paper in your pocket or on your phone that you can stick to neutral topics yeah. where you can keep your engagement minimal and keep your expectations realistic. It's almost like a game of chess, right? Like you have to be completely prepared and yes. anticipate their next move. Now, I wanted to segue into the impact of narcissistic abuse on the body, the mind, and the soul. And I know, Wendy, you have a lot to say on this topic. Let's talk about the connection between being a victim of narcissistic abuse and what happens to our bodies, the uh, autoimmunity that can result. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think this was the big eye-opener for me, most of all, is the discard. I mean, in the, in the narcissistic abuse cycle, idealize, devalue, discard. The discard is so devastating. And as now, The discard is when the narcissist says, I'm done you, with you. It throws you away like your mm -hmm. existence is just completely irrelevant. Um, I know my body went into, you know, survival mode. It was attacking itself non-stop for weeks at a time for weeks continuously you mean like you got sick well you know what I actually went to the medical doctor they tried they went through every test on me and they couldn't find anything and I finally ended up with a natural path who has different methods and um, by that point I'd already developed digestion issues so SIBO but what I can say is it felt like my body was attacking itself it was just um, you know when you're sick you're so sick and you're sweating my whole body was like that and a lot of people like to say well you know you're menopause and that sort of thing but this being somebody who is very familiar with being in her body um, my body was not functioning optimally that is definitely for sure so it had a big impact I mean obviously mentally but physically as well and I think that it, component of the narcissistic abuse cycle is not talked about nearly enough is uh, the health ramifications we have a question that just came in from our Facebook viewers my ex is a narcissist and mentally abusive our four-year-old is starting to talk and treat me like he did how do I break this cycle I just had a shiver go through me dr. Jackson what do you think what, what would you advise this person well first of all I think that um, 
genetic expression is very impacted by the environment. And so this little person, this four-year-old, does not have to grow into being a narcissist like his father, um, or I assume it's the father and the mother's written in today. Um, and I think that um, she she can uh, read a lot of books and she There's can... There's a book that you brought in today to show us. Um, yeah, this this book is more related to the notion of, um, you know, how to deal with a narcissist who you can't get away from. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Children of the Self-Absorbed and it relates to um, growing up with a parent who's a, a narcissist and treats you like an extension of themselves. And uh, Could you just hold the book up for our viewers? Sure. Yeah. And so that's something that you recommend for I people do. read? Yeah. I do recommend yeah. it to a lot of my clients. As, as it was pointed out repeatedly, it tends to be the, the people who've been victimized by narcissistic people who come into therapy to recover from mm -hmm. uh, that experience. Yeah. Um, so, so the point being, uh, the very well-informed mother can help the child learn, uh, can actually learn empathy, uh, can, uh, as we all do, teach children to take turns and that they're not so special that uh, uh, they, they get to run the show completely on their own. Um, so uh, the good thing is that she's noticing behaviors. It may be totally normal four-year-old behaviors mm. because kids... Uh, they're just mirroring. They, uh, well, they go through... Uh, stages of self-absorption mm -hmm. mm -hmm. until they mature enough to be able to uh, perceive the other person as um, like they are. Mm -hmm. But Do it's also true little kids can show empathy to others. Dr. Romani, mm -hmm. anything to add to that for our viewer that wrote in? You know, I also say that, you know, many times people feel like, you know, when you're co-parenting with a narcissist, I always tell them you're not co-parenting, you're single parenting with an elephant on your back. Wow. And you need to be better. So you really end up becoming like the sole vessel of empathy. And a lot of your work as the non-narcissistic parent in these kinds of co-parenting situations is really to model empathy, to model emotional regulation to make it okay to talk about emotion. I totally agree with you know, Dr. Jackson's suggestions on playing games, teaching them how to be good losers and winners. I also tell parents, sit down and read a book with your child and then stop the book from time to time and have your child reflect on how a character may be feeling in that story. So they get to practice that muscle. Oh, that bear must be very sad. Or if they're watching a movie or something like that, pause the movie, pause the TV show, say, how do you think the cat feels right now? So they're always having to reflect, yeah, the cat's sad. Why do you think the cat is sad? So they start connecting experience and emotion and feel permission to talk about it. And finally, as that child gets older, Many times that child will be confused, especially if their parent is saying something hurtful. Never throw the other parent under the bus because it's very confusing for the child, but also don't gaslight your own child. And let them know, yeah, gosh, that must, that must have been hard, honey. I'm so sorry. How are you feeling? Touch base with them on how they're feeling if they witness their parent behaving badly. Dr. Armani, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening and for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, and your guidance. Now, I know you, you uh, travel a lot and you're planning to come to Canada soon. Where can our viewers mm -hmm. go to learn about upcoming events and uh, publications or to buy your books? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'd love it if they'd follow us on Instagram. And my Instagram is at Dr. Romani, D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I. And you can also go to my website at drromani.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I.com. And also follow my work on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel where we put out two new videos a week. A lot of that is also crowdsourced. If you have ideas for topics you want to hear about, we have people submit those suggestions. And then if you want to know more about my seminars and events, that's on my website, on my Instagram. And then we do YouTube and Instagram Lives once a week. If you want to submit questions in real time, hopefully we'll choose yours to answer. I love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramani. We're looking forward to seeing you on this side of the border. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.
And we just have a couple of minutes left before we go to break. Maybe, Wendy, you can uh, talk quickly a little bit about uh, some of the work that you do with mm -hmm. helping women in the community. Mm -hmm. So I host a weekly Empowered Abandonment Women's Support Group. Um, it's uh, a format. It's a structured format. First component of it is focusing on the feelings. Second component is a discussion on a topic that's identified for the week. And the final is always a self uh, self-esteem building activity. So. Is there a cost to attend? Um, the cost is usually about five or six dollars and it's just for the cost of the room. Okay, so okay. my so time is 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 it's great. very accessible, yeah. and then people can join any time. Yep, um, they just need to go to empoweredabandonment.com and register. And there is a limitation on, on seating, obviously, so they do need to register. You can't just drop in. And viewers can find you uh, find more information on the website. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. And Dr. Jackson, any final thoughts for our viewers? Well, I have to come back to my theme that the a majority of uh, people with narcissism aren't so far gone that they're malignant narcissists and that they often will come into situations where they're going to need some help and that uh, it's definitely um, a disorder that can be treated and uh, can be helped uh, through empathetic listening and uh, approaches that allow them uh, a type of sounding board that feels good to them but also helps them learn. So you believe that narcissism is treatable? Yes. And can a narcissist or a person in a relationship with a narcissist have a happy ending? I think so, yes. And what would that happy ending look like? I guess you'd have to manage your expectation of that like Dr. Ramani was saying. And earlier. also, there, everybody, whether they have a diagnosis or not, is an individual. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much to you both uh, for your time and for sharing your wisdom. Uh, one more time, uh, the book that you have uh, written and published, Wendy, mm -hmm. uh, where can we get a copy of that? Um, you can go to my website, justjalen.com, which is the name of the book, and you can order it from there. Perfect. And uh, go to your website as well to attend the classes. Absolutely. As well. And, and I want to point out, I did not write this book. Okay. <laughs> this book, book was written you... by Nina Brown and it's available everywhere. Wonderful. Thank you so much to you both for coming in and for sharing your insight and your guidance. Thank you so much to the viewers for joining us this evening on this conversation about narcissism. We look forward to seeing you in the studio next week. Have a great night.